If you're just joining us on YouTube, then welcome. We'll be starting in a minute. Hello, Nick Smith here, speaking to you from London. Welcome to number 24 in our series of Alpine Clubcasts. This evening we're joined by Conrad Anker, one of the most prolific explorers and mountaineers of today. I really hope you enjoy it. The Alpine Club is in normal times an extremely active club for alpinists, and we're always looking for potential new members. We welcome both experienced alpinists and those gathering their experience who may be suited to aspirant membership. If you'd like more information on joining, then please get in touch with me, I run the Meets programme, or have a look at our website. And if you're watching an Alpine Clubcast for the first time today, then a special welcome to you. With us this week, we have members of two clubs, the Rockhoppers and the North London Mountaineering Club. It's great to have you with us. And if you're watching live on YouTube or Zoom, please add any questions for Conrad to the chat as we go along. We'll try to get those answered at the end. And as usual, anyone in Zoom, you will be unmuted at the end for any applause and do stick around for a chat. Conrad Anker's career has for 30 years been one of a true all-round climber, from big wall first ascents on El Capitan to three ascents of Mount Everest to pioneering difficult new routes in the most remote corners of the planet. He and Alex Lowe, his late climbing partner and best friend, became climbing's rock stars of the 90s, setting speed records in the Himalaya and Antarctica. In more than 25 years of expeditions to Nepal, Conrad and his wife Jennifer have developed deep relationships with the Sherpa people, and they founded the Kumbu Climbing Centre in Fortsi, Nepal, which provides safety training to high-altitude workers. The award-winning film documentary Meru shows brilliantly what it's like to be Conrad Anker. Back in 1999, Conrad added a big chapter to the mystery of the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition when he discovered the body of George Mallory on Everest's north side. Today, though, Conrad's going to talk about Antarctica. His 12th visit was in 2017 to the Wolf's Jaw Massif in one of the world's last great climbing frontiers, the Queen Maud Land Territory. He was part of the North Face team which included Jimmy Chin, Savannah Cummings and Anna Pfaff, Alex Honnold and Cedar Wright. In total, that team climbed 15 peaks in just 17 days, with Conrad and Jimmy tackling a bold new route on the 3,600 foot Ulvatana. Conrad Anko is joining us from his home in Bozeman, Montana. Welcome, Conrad. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Nick, for the uh, introduction and um, welcome everyone. I'm uh, calling in from my uh, basement office in Bozeman, Montana on the uh, traditional lands, the Silash, Kootenai, Crow and other indigenous uh, peoples here in Montana. So what a treat to be here. So um, yeah, my good friend Victor is there and uh, John Porter and, <laughs> and a lot of other acquaintances. So um, I long for the day where I can get back to the UK and tap into that rich mountaineering history that all of you have and, and all that, um, that that beautiful things that go with it. And um, I look forward to getting back to the Kendall Film Festival. Although, isn't it like the Kendall Drinking Festival? But <laughs> you guys know how to have a good time there. So anyways, um, today's presentation is about Antarctica and I'm gonna jump into a screen share here. And there we go. Let's start with that. And to bring this down. And we take that. Oh, nope, sorry. Take that off. Nope, sorry. There we go. Ah, I'm getting all sorts of uh, backlog here. So 
pop in things. But um, this is how I got uh, started. And um, this was um, my family. I'm the, this guy here with the jug ears. And this is uh, uh, Mount Dana in uh, Yosemite National Park, just outside of where my family's from. And this is Alex Lowe. Um, back when we had more hair and we were, <laughs> this was 91. Times were different. And um, this is Jennifer and Jennifer and Alex's three boys, um, Isaac there on the right, Sam in the middle and Max in the background. And um, so this is what I do. I go up and suffer in the mountains, which is um, kind of a, um, a, real, a real challenging thing to do. Um, but what it comes down to is this uh, question by Camus, which is, we love to do what we do, but we know it can take our life. And finding that balance is really all where it is. And uh, I wouldn't be complete without mentioning Jenny and our family. We're now April 6th, we'll be 20 years married. So kind of a, a wonderful journey we've had. And the boys are now, they're all grown up and doing grown up things and all that. So on to Antarctica. And it is the uh, fifth largest land mass on, um, on, uh, on our planet as a continent wise, it has um, 90% of the world's glaciers and tied up in that ice is 70% of the world's fresh water. And in times of antiquity, it was known that there was this cold and forbidding place at the bottom of the, the map as they saw that, but it wasn't until um, the 19th century in the 1850s when whalers ventured south looking for um, for commerce, for whaling and things like that. And then um, once it was discovered and landfall was made, um, people started traveling there, obviously with the, um, the story of Robert Falcon Scott and Amundsen in their quest for the South Pole, Shackleton and his goal of um, going across uh, the continent and everything like that. So just as a, um, a real quick here, this is, um, this is where Ellsworth is. This is the Ellsworth Range. It's the highest point in, um, of, in Antarctica. These are the Transantarctic Range, um, the Gothic Mountains. Uh, recently, a couple of years ago, Leo Holding had a great ski expedition where they kited in, climbed, and then kited back out. And then over here, this would be South Africa um, to the north. This is where Queen Maudland is. And um, it is um, all of Antarctica is kind of split out into a pie um, with the International Antarctic Treaty, which was put into effect in 1957 during the International Geophysical Year. And within that, um, there's certain uh, sectors of the pie that each of the nations, their signatories um, lay claim to, but there isn't um, anything that's going over that. So this time we are, um, we're gonna focus on um, the, um, this, uh, uh, the Queen Mod range there. So I'm trying to lose that bar up there. Nope, that's not where it's happening. But anyways, um, sorry about that. But this is um, the, uh, the, the Queen Mod land. And what we have here is these uh, pretty much giant nun attacks. And so looking right of screen would be to the uh, uh, South Pole and the uh, massive polar ice sheet. And then to the left would be out towards the coast. And we first visited this range, 96, 97, um, about 25 years ago, and we were on the other side. So we came back um, with the goal of, um, of, of climbing here um, on an expedition. So that was our setup with it. And um, kind of uh, around the same time, this the gentleman here, Ivar Eric Tolofsson, who was there um, when we were there in 96, 97, did the first ascent of, um, of, of uh, many of the ranges in there. And you can see um, referencing the, the Queen Mod book that they brought in there. And so our team was uh, determined to go down there and have fun. Um, and so we put all of our material in pallets and then air freighted it over to Cape Town, South Africa sorted it out in a warehouse to get all of the equipment ready in between. Um, we weren't able to fly in due to weather. So the um, opportunity for rock climbing in Cape Town is um, off the chart. So it's a really compact, solid quartzite, metamorphosed lamps, limestone. And so um, also bought in the, um, there's one of the world's most famous uh, 
arboretums there with, with a, a great range of, of botany and things like that. So staying fit, but eventually um, we got onto the continent um, and these are with the uh, Novosibirsk, which is um, the, the, the range um, that we were used to get in there. And so using these um, Aleutian um, jets, they're really sturdy. Um, this is a Russian outfit. And then um, the LCI is the name of their outfit and they provide uh, support for researchers and scientists and, and the like. So once we landed into the, uh, the continent, we were uh, again challenged with weather and that was, um, um, we then sat in a hut and you know, had to wait for things to go. So these are containers um, doing our exercises in between battling the storm. Um, this is Jimmy, my best friend and fellow who I've been on many adventures over the past 20 years. And once we landed with the uh, Aleutian, our next bump was with a twin otter. And these are aircraft that are, um, de Havilland. They're manufactured in Canada. They kind of quit production in the late 60s, early 70s. So all the planes are, they're mechanically sound, but um, they're known for the ability to um, short takeoff and landing, and they're really indispensable in the bush. So Ken Boric Air, which is based out of Calgary, they run the contract down there, and they fly these wonderful planes down each year to get in there. So the um, looking over looking over the range here. This is Olvatana, which is Wolf's Tooth, and um, is the prominent um, the peak there. And we were um, 25 years ago. We were to the right of screening another one, and so all these other peaks in here. So um, Leo Holding and team, good buddy Leo, climbed this ridge there. Um, the, uh, the the easiest route kind of comes up this side over here. Um, there's also uh, another route that goes up on the backside. But for any of you that are hungry wall climbers out there, this shady side is um, unclimbed. It's probably the biggest, steepest, coldest, most desperate big wall left on the planet. So um, I'm not holding back any secrets there. So once we landed, um, we're perched up on here and um, it's kind of foreshortened with a wide angle lens, but um, Vatana and the route that was originally pioneered by um, the Norwegian came up this snow flank up through here and kind of wove up there. So um, the Andy Kirkpatrick base jumper route is kind of around the side and comes up the back side of that. And then the route that Jimmy and I um, sought after will show pictures kind of goes up this dihedral up and around the back side of that, uh, that point there. So this is Alex Honnold. Um, Probably best known for um, climbing El Cap without a rope. He kind of turned it into a uh, boulder problem. Incredibly um, uh, you know, daring, uh, adventurous feat. And so this was, um, we'd been on expeditions before, but he was uh, kind of after, this was just uh, six, seven months after climbing El Cap without a rope, and we went down here. And so it was interesting. He and Cedar they got after everything. They never camped out on the wall and they climbed all these peaks in there. And of course, Alex is, he's funny because he's like, yeah, you know, if you were a real climber, you'd climb something more than one peak. And of course I had to come back to him like, well, dude, I mean, you're climbing the low angle slabs. I mean, of course, <laughs> and we're always like friendly joshing back and forth. Um, and Jimmy, who I've been on, um, a ton of expeditions with and, and been there as, as a friend and a mentor over the years. Anna um, is photographed by Sap Cummings here on the trip and um, just some of the beauty that was within that. And so um, as far as mountaineering objectives, really um, a lot of fascinating rock. And if you are a, um, a fan of geology, um, a lot of the rock here has been uplifted without having the mechanical scouring that glaciers have. So where there was glacial action and it's in the glaciers have then receded, it has that, the feel of say like Tuolumne where it's been cleaned up. But the rock that's then forced up is this um, high grit. It's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly abrasive. It just destroys your ropes and your hands and clothing. And it's about like climbing up a cheese grater. Here's uh, a selfie courtesy of Cedar, Alex and Anna and Sab on there the ladies in their selfie. And so this is what Jimmy and I did. And we thought, oh, this is gonna be great fun. But the, um, the route that we ended up climbing was a, um, a big giant off width. 
So um, always got to have your pirate flags there just because, right? <laughs> but um, the type of climbing where you got to move up bit by bit um, using an ascender to give you um, strength on that and then fixing rope. And so this is one of the occasional places where there was um, decent rock on this pitch. But the challenge with free climbing is that you need to have direct sun. And so we maybe had an hour or two each day where it'd warm up, but it would be frightfully cold. So it was kind of ended up being um, old school climbing in, in, in the sense that it was aid climbing and moving up on it. And um, here's Jimmy looking pretty heroic. So, but um, yeah, this is uh, the sort of climbing that um, I enjoy most where there's that sense of unknown and that um, having to go up and, and, and try um, to the best of your abilities. Once we were at camp, we um, built out a, a, a dome tent and carved in a kitchen in there, which is um, one of the best parts of it is that you get this chance to, um, to meet up afterwards as you're, when you're done climbing and, and that, that communal feel. And that's, a lot of that is really what brings us close to being um, in Antarctica and, or anywhere in that matter, that, that we have this chance to, um, to bond with our fellow humans. And if there's one thing that climbing has taught me over the years is that um, it's not about us. It's about our game that we play with gravity and to play that game well with gravity, you need team. You need someone to be part of that with you. And that human connection that we have as climbers is unique. And, um, and perhaps people, they have that connection in, in poetry or in medicine or uh, bowling or cricket or whatever one chooses to do. And finding that, um, that magic where you get to interact with other humans is really the, um, the key part. So quick um, thank you. This is uh, Jimmy and, and this is uh, about the midnight sun on a, on a cold overcast day, completely bundled up and a, a sincere amount of uh, gratitude for him and his photographs that have illustrated the presentation this morning. And then um, also his work on the Meru film as uh, Nick mentioned at the beginning of the presentation and also with free solo. So if your, uh, if your grandmother wants to know what climbing is, yeah, rent free solo for her. No, <laughs> there's probably better ways to do it. This is Alex looking pretty, uh, looking pretty badass because he is just basically badass. Sav, or pardon me, this is Anna and Savannah. So this is all of our uh, hanging out at camp. Pablo is uh, like the most dedicated, hardworking guy, super, super chill, super friendly. Alex and I being goofy. And then the, um, the snow petrel, which is this wonderful bird that migrates in from the coast to then um, breed during a very small um, window um, during the summer where they're up there, um, they're able to, uh, to, to find a nest and they're free of predators in there. So they, they get away from where the, uh, the skua is. But it was um, kind of interesting climbing here in Antarctica, the amount of um, logistics that went into it, um, the preparation, and then also um, sort of weighing over you as you climb the, the severity of the situation. And so when the the outfit that brings us down there, they're like, don't get hurt because if you get hurt, then the rescue is incredibly, um, is incredibly difficult. So that, that works within you. But um, there's always a window of opportunity and that's what makes humans unique is that we team together to, uh, to jump into those opportunities and get things going. So that is um, super brief overview, I guess, of, um, of uh, Queen Maudland and I'll um, pass the, uh, the, the speaking stick over to Nick. He's got some questions and we'll open it up to, um, to everyone here. So I uh, really appreciate this. Thank you, Conrad. Fantastic. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, thanks for sharing. So folks, if you have a question for Conrad, uh, do raise a hand or type a question into the chat. That's either on Zoom or YouTube. Um, and I'll read those out. Um, while we're waiting for those to come in, uh, don't forget you can catch up on all the previous Alpine Club casts on the Alpine Club Library YouTube page. So, um, 
Oh, I can see Alex Metcalf has raised a hand already. So let's uh, let's try and unmute you, Alex. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Cool. Great talk, Conrad. Um, I did have one question for you. This is actually at the um, at Nick's suggestion, but what advice would you have for somebody um, due to go on their first expedition? Oh, first expedition advice. Um, mm -hmm. Well, find something that um, is within your comfort zone. Don't have that be the expedition that you want to go push the envelope and try something in over your head, know where you're at, and then uh, plan accordingly. And um, kind of the, um, the background for the type of climbing I, I like to do, I like to climb granite peaks um, in the greater ranges. Um, limestone's great, but they're too dangerous on the bigger mountains. Granite offers um, really good solid rock. So um, as an aspiring climber in the 80s, my um, mentor Muggs was like, hey, if you want to get good, two things you got to do. One, climb El Capitan and two, climb Denali. So um, you climb the shield or a nail up on El Cap, then you have your systems really dialed in over a 3,000 foot climb. And then on Denali, you have um, being able to winter camp and take care of yourself. And so combining those two expeditions then allows for going out and doing things like going to Queen Maudland or going to the Gangotri region, uh, Meru and peaks like that. Cool, thank you. Brilliant, thanks, thanks Alex. Um, Conrad, I, I, it was great to see such a mix of people in, in the team that you had there. Um, and I, I've read a bit about how Muggs Stump, um, his influence on you, you know, as a mentor. Um, so you, you've got, you know, decades of expedition wisdom to pass on to, you know, younger climbers in your teams. Um, I mean, what, what advice do you offer young, young climbers apart from, obviously, apart from your experience in that sort of situation? Um, well, get into climbing because you enjoy doing it. I think that's fairly obvious. You're not going to excel at anything if you don't, um, if you're not passionate and driven to go do it. So that's really a key part to it. And then um, there's uh, just don't let your guard down. Um, it's um, gravity plays for keeps. And if you play organized sports, it's sort of this, um, we create a time frame, we create rules, we put a ball in it, we have a few tools and then you pit human against human and then one team wins another team loses or another individual loses another individual wins. And that was really never my stick, um, so to say. And being here in the United States, our form of football is just, you just go there and you beat the heck out of each other with helmets on and it's pretty violent. <laughs> like, oh God. These guys who were like bullying me in the, in the classroom, now they're like putting on pads and just clocking me. And so it didn't make any sense to me. But at the same time, I had an opportunity to um, get kind of connected to the outdoors and scouting uh, my dad, his buddies, um, going out with my family. And so that was always um, that point in there. And it's, it's interesting in that climbing doesn't have like a governing body. I mean, Olympics accepted and the way it's, it's transitioned, but it's always been this experiential journey that we go out, we go to the mountains, we see what we can, we can, how we challenge ourselves and we come back and we, it's this full circle of experience from the preparation, the anticipation, the execution of the project, the return and getting back to home and then having the, another idea germinate. And that, that continuous loop to me is fascinating. And although the climbs that I'll be doing at age 58 or different than the ones I was doing at 28, that same fundamental attraction to being with your friends outdoors is remains the same. And when I see that in young climbers and I'm like, yeah, that's the type of energy I want to tap into. Thanks comrade. Um, yeah, um, the, I can see there's a message that's been written into the chat. Uh, this actually leads on nicely from what you've just said. Um, Alex Keeping, a huge pleasure to listen to you, Mr. Anker. Thank you for taking the time. Um, would love to hear a sneak peek of any future climbing plans you have and what 
we can hope to see in the future? <laughs> well, that's a good one. Well, um, November 16th, 2016, I was on Lunagri, which was the um, highest permitted unclimbed peak in Nepal, and I suffered a heart attack. And so that was pretty life-changing. It was nine hours from incident to when I um, was airlifted to a hospital in Kathmandu and had the um, had a, uh, had a, a stent put in. So that was pretty much uh, a life changer. And on my own end, and then with the family, it was like, okay, you can let go of um, climbing these 7,000 meter granite peaks. So um, that's kind of 7,000 meters and below, <clears throat> usually around 6,000, 6,000, around that elevation um, of granite peaks in the Himalayas, which is my happy place in life. So I've let that, um, I've let that be. Um, but I, the, the motivation of climbing and what, I, what it brings to me in the community still remains the same. And it won't be at that same edge that I was, but eventually a walk in the woods will be equivalent to what I did when I was in my 30s. And so that, um, that, that you always adjust your outlook and positivity given the challenges that you have there. So, um, but yeah, the um, sort of near term um, is um, spending time in Nepal with the uh, Nepali climbing community and doing what I can to share my knowledge of climbing and, um, but not necessarily high peak climbing, but um, specifically rock climbing and ice climbing. There's a tremendous um, opportunity for uh, route development and interaction with, with people um, in that sense. And so that um, being present in the moment but in terms of a big audacious goal, I've, I no longer have my hands on the rein, and I'm happy to pass that on to the next generation. So thank you, Alexander, for a good question. Brilliant. There's, there's a question coming in from YouTube. Um, so Nigel, do you want to read that one out? Hi, Nick. Uh, we, have a, we have a few. Uh, we've got people from all over. Uh, so we've got people from Austin, Switzerland, uh, Dubai, Montana. Um, got three questions. Um, Damien asks, what other animals did you see whilst you were there? Oh, in Antarctica, the only animals that we saw were the uh, snow petrels, and they would come nest in the mountains, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the cracks there. So they're doing that to avoid the skua, which is um, kind of a... Um, a predatory uh, bird that takes out their nest. So they would then fly that um, 100 miles in from the coast to see that. And then the other living thing that we saw was uh, lichen. And I was always um, keen to find lichen when I was there, but it's, um, it's a pretty um, inhospitable, it's a very brutal climate um, and environment, but it's also very delicate if, if you can imagine that juxtaposition. So when you're in the tropics and you're in um, the Congo basin or you're in the Amazon basin, you have a tremendous amount of biodiversity with an incredible amount of flora and fauna in terms of species count um, within that web. But then the further and the more extreme the environment gets, which is what the Alpine is. When you go to the high Alpine, you're basically in a place like Antarctica where you're close to perpetual winter, um, the amount of sunlight and the amount of um, plant life that is there is a lot less. But um, when you are in Antarctica, if you are on the peninsula, you'll see quite a bit of wildlife. Um, so marine mammals, uh, the pinnipeds, um, walruses, all, a, lot, a lot of them in there. Um, but um, yeah, penguins, no polar bears. <laughs> but um, when you're in interior, it's a, you're, you're in, quite literally the frozen desert. Thanks, Conrad. We have a few more questions that like, are coming in. Shall I just go ahead with YouTube questions for now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so what was the wind like and how often was it uh, gentle enough that you were able to climb? The wind is your constant invisible adversary. And it, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, people don't, they'll be like, oh, it's clear weather. Why didn't you go up there? <laughs> and 
So if you've been on the higher mountains and you're at camp and you can, it sounds like a freight train rolling down the tracks and that's the wind going on there. So um, one, it, it affects your balance, um, your spatial relationship, but also it gets quite a bit colder. And um, so, yeah, the in, in that region, there was um, probably more wind events than constant wind fall um, or, or wind, it wasn't like a constant. So it would be quite calm and then we'd get a, a windstorm coming through. Um, but what's amazing is the um, weather forecasting ability. And when 25, 30 years ago, when I was climbing in Patagonia or I was climbing in Antarctica or Alaska, it was sort of, um, you need kind of put your finger to the wind and look out the window and, and, and make an assumption, should I get going or what's going to happen with it. And now um, the predictive models are really amazing. And um, we were in contact with Novosibirsk and they're like, oh, we're going to be at your camp at, at 0800 and we're going to pick you up. And we're like, wow, it's snowing and overcast here. And, and they were like, they could see the front moving across on their radar. And so when it came around to um, that, that predictive weather there. So wind's always an adversary, but it wasn't um, as extreme as it is say in the Ellsworth range, um, which is uh, the Vincent Massif. Thanks. Okay, we've got, uh, they keep coming in. Um, did you know it's changes between um, the two trips? I, I think you've been quite a lot more than that, haven't you? Um, you know, 13 now. Um, so have you noticed changes, uh, climate related changes um, whilst you've been? Yeah, great question. And um, yeah, climate change in Antarctica. And what, say, visiting Queen Maudland and going back 22 years later, um, and no, both times being there for two, three weeks, nothing really extensive. So all we have is anecdotal um, observations and information on that. So we, don't have that same um, understanding that a meteorologist and a climatologist would have. Um, so the best understanding in Antarctica with climate is the ice core and the ability to go back 100,000 years and be able to, um, by studying the oxygen isotope, being able to understand the CO2 levels in our atmosphere. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, um, a, a trained scientist. I'm a hobbyist when it comes to geology and climate. I, I like to follow, I like to read as many papers, but what we see is, is, um, is um, anecdotal. We see weather, but weather collectively in a cumulative overview of weather is what climate is. And so, yeah, there's, um, there's no question that Antarctica itself is uh, warming um, at a at a faster rate, um, the high latitude, which is closer to the poles and high altitude are feeling the effects of climate um, more so than other places. And where we live here in Montana, we're, we're battling drought and, um, and, and, and things change in, in, a, in, a, in a short period of time. Um, shall, I, shall I come in there, um, Nigel? Sorry yeah, to yeah. come back to you too. There's a couple of questions to do, I mean, continuing that theme um, from Robin and also um, Rosalind. Um, Rosalind says, thank you for a wonderful, inspiring talk. What are your views, if any, on commercial climbing expeditions to the Antarctic? And Robin, a sort of similar kind of theme, you know, would there, is there an argument perhaps for places such as Queen Maudland, um, you know, not being visited? Yeah, great question. Um, so basically, um, the Na International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, they work together as a trade group, and then they work with the governing nations that are part of the International Antarctic Treaty. And so, um, yeah, there's two sides to it. Um, and we have that same challenge here in the United States as probably in the UK around the world is, um, there's preservation and protection, and then there's providing recreation opportunities. And so we're, we see it here in the United States where people want to go to Yellowstone National Park, but they're loving it to death. And so 
how do we preserve that natural environment, but do we still allow people to enjoy it? Um, there are sections um, in Antarctica that are um, that do not have um, human presence, and it's primarily to study climate and to have a um, non-polluted type thing. Um, the same thing that um, the big debate on whether they should drill through into Lake Vostok, which is a subglacial lake of enormous pr proportions underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. And there's more of these. And obviously once you put the drill bit in there, you're introducing uh, pollutants, uh, microbes, and, and you've contaminated that. Um, so in the instance of Queen Maudland, um, there's uh, granite spires or um, it's what we like to do. We like to climb mountains and, and that um, there. Um, but yeah, to, to find that, that balance is, is certainly a question. And part of it is that um, recreation in Antarctica is limited um, by the, the, the economics of it, the finance of it. And it's just incredibly expensive to get there. So, um, and yes, the, I would say from a collective societal standpoint, the, the science that's being undertaken in Antarctica um, is it's always um, in one way or another, it's connected to climate change. Um, back when, before plate tectonics and we had one Gondwana land, there was, um, were palm trees and there was, you know, Antarctica has changed and we understand that from a um, geologic sense. And so the information that we gather from Antarctica um, about the atmospheric CO2 levels and how our climate is changing is really important. And within that, um, in Antarctica, the cold water, the fresh cold water that is, um, that is a result of the, the glaciers uh, melting and is a natural outflow of it, that heavier cold fresh water drops down to the bottom of the ocean and then pushing up the warm saline water. And so that's kind of the engine that drives the world's ocean currents and that um, a lot of that is is um, where it brings nutrients up from the deep ocean um, it affects the world's fisheries and everything like that so um, probably everyone that's listening in understands um, human connectedness to the natural environment and where we are in terms of um, our impact on it and for all of us watching this this show here, it's going to be easy street. Yeah, we're going to have plenty of carbon and we can live this uh, a comfortable lifestyle. But um, for people that don't have access to the extent of uh, fossil fuel based energy that we do or future generations that will be addressing peak carbon in the atmosphere and how it changes um, the environment is, is um, certainly a, a challenge. And it's something that um, I care deeply about um, one because there's a responsibility as someone that consumes an inordinate amount of carbon and has a, an effect on the climate that that we have within our nation state structure, educational and institutional ways that we can address this and understand it and look to find ways to uh, mitigate uh, human impact. But um, there's we won't be able to see into the future, but there is um, collectively a responsibility that, that is for all of us. Thanks, Conrad. In fact, um, the, for, for any sort of members or, or people viewing, there's a, the Alpine Club have just produced, um, the Alpine Club's environmental panel have produced recommendations on travel and climate change uh, for us as alpinists. So if you want to, have a look at the Alpine Club website. Uh, you can read that, um, which Ed Douglas has just done a fantastic job on. So we'll go, we'll go to YouTube again in a minute, but before we do that, I've got a couple of questions for you, Conrad, about home life uh, from George. He, he was wondering, um, uh, he's curious about your training. Uh, is it different now from when you were in your 20s? Uh, and then the other question uh, from Marie, uh, what an amazing inspiration, she says. Uh, I see that your own parents set you on the adventure and passion, and I expect are very proud of you. Um, are, your ch are your children following in your footsteps? Yeah, great questions, and um, really appreciate the, uh, the, the uh, insight into that. So really, um, it's a great way. But um, both my parents have 
passed away. Um, so their, um, their carbon's being dutifully recycled into something else. So on this four and a half billion year cycle that we're on. But yeah, they were, um, they introduced it to me at a young age and that was, I was very thankful for them along those lines. And to the same extent, um, Max, Sam and Isaac all enjoy getting outdoors. Um, they, high level climbing isn't their game. Um, it's kind of, um, you know, Alex lost his life doing it and it's, it's dangerous, we get that. So, um, but this, the joy and satisfaction that we get from being out there is really important. Um, in terms of fitness, um, staying active every day, um, trying to, um, our bodies kind of got to where we are on about a base level of about four miles of walking a day. So um, always, I mean, I'm not walking four miles a day, but um, when I do get out, I try to exercise and, 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 and be outdoors and to increase the heart rate. So um, I used to... Um, be a dedicated runner and would run a marathon a year and, and always challenging myself with that. But um, post heart attack and um, just sort of understanding where my body is changing, I'm, I'm less, um, I can get that same exercise by walking and then doing um, yoga, stretching, um, going to the climbing gym, basically um, a lot of those things, but, um, and then being mindful of what you eat. I mean, if you're eating fish and chips and a tankard of beer every night, it's going to catch up to you. So you got to eat healthy with that um, in that sense. But, um, but by the other measure is that um, we have a, a very precious small amount of time on this planet. And to me, being outdoors and walking through the forest and listening to the birds sing or being surrounded by trees is is better for my soul than say i've got to do 150 burpees and i've got to do x amount of core exercises and um and yeah i trained when i was young but now it's um i find things that bring an intrinsic reward and that kind of helps settle my mind because we're in this oversubscribed hyper connected, digitally drowning world. And how do you undo that? And for myself, it's going out and being in nature and seeing trees and leaves and being part of that. So <laughs> hope that helps out. Thank you, Conrad. So should we go back to YouTube, Nigel? Do you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks for the promotion there, uh, Conrad, on my exercise plan and diet. Fish and chips. And oh, yeah, beer. <laughs> um, so Robin Roma has a question. Um, who had the idea to bring the pirate flag? Oh, <laughs> I'm I like I uh, I've always been a pirate flag guy. That <laughs> So it was. Um, yeah, I would start hanging pirate flags off my portal ledge and on El Cap and just sort of, um, you know, and there's there's the pirates of old and yore. And yeah, certainly weren't uh, great people when they're raiding and stealing from ships, but kind of like that, the, the, a little bit of a rebellion. So um, yeah, it was, it's interesting when I go to these international base camps and, you know, we went to Antarctica and it was like, oh, there's each of these nationalities. They had their, their country flags up there and all that. So, but um, we've got a rebellious streak, climbers do. <laughs> um, perhaps more so in, in the United States, our, our DNA is, um, <clears throat> is rich with fellows like uh, Fred Becky and Leighton Core and Jim Bridwell. And so, I mean, yeah, they, um, they, they're, they're a little bit of a different outlook on that. So I embrace that spirit. So, but yeah, if you, um, yeah, find a pirate flag and <laughs> it's all good humor. Just I'll be more pirate. Yeah. Um, uh, so Neil uh, asks, um, have you had the opportunity to climb much in Scotland? And if so, what do you think? Oh, love Scotland. And it, um, I was there in, I think, March, April of 95 to go ice climbing. And it, um, 
the, the flowers were up and it was a warm winter and there was no ice. So um, we ended up not uh, climbing that. So on my bucket list of things to do in life, and I guess if COVID has done anything for us, it's like, yeah, what 10 things do you want to do before you pass away? And one of them is ice climbing in Scotland. And it's, um, I'm just, I love the, the idea of rime ice forming up there and then the rich history of Ben Nevis and the different climbs and um, the traditional outlook to it. So all of that is um, something that's meaningful. So hoping that uh, we get a cold winter one year and um, combine it with ice climbing in Norway and, and, and a trip to Scotland. Um, and by the same measure, please come visit us in Montana. So there's... <laughs> That's the beauty of climbing is that wherever you are in the world, there's some cliff or another that you can then go to and go climbing. And when you meet the fellow climbers there, it's like, regardless of language, you already have a community. And so whether um, visiting Delhi and going to the Delhi University climbing team and having 20 new best friends that you go out to dinner with afterwards or going to Scotland and having a meetup to go climb on the bend, all those um, that's the community and fabric that that is so that that this rich tapestry of what climbing is. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, Simon Richardson's in uh, this evening, so uh, maybe he could uh, you could hook up with him one day. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Conrad, do you, um, do you mind if we go to Everest? I wanted to ask you. Um, as you know, it's going to be in. 2024, it will be the centenary of the of the death of Mallory on on Mallory and Irving on Everest. And of course, you you when you went in 1999, um, you found his body um, at 8,200 200 meters on the north side of Everest. I just wanted to ask, you know, how you felt when you you realised it was Mallory that you'd found, and um, and then when you went to the summit a couple of weeks later, did you know? Did you wonder whether Mallory and Irving had got to the top? Yeah, uh, great question. And it's always um, sharing this with um, the UK audience is something that I, um, is always meaningful. I mean, he, uh, George Mallory and Sandy Irvin and the pioneering English expeditions were um, the foundation for all subsequent ascents, the trips in the thirties and then the eventual uh, success in 1953. So each generation takes the previous generation's knowledge and expertise and then builds upon it. Um, also very thankful to um, the research expedition. Um, Eric Simonson, the leader of that, and Dave Hahn, who invited me along that. And it was, um, I was invited along to have a go at the uh, second step to see what the technical difficulties would, would be part of that. So I wasn't um, a searcher, so to say, but it was, um, just by chance that on the 1st of May, 1999, that um, I came upon the, the frozen and, 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 and well-preserved body of George Lee Mallory. And it was um, a very humbling moment for all of us that spend time in the mountains, we have to make peace with death and mortality and um, that you understand what that is and how, that, how you work through it. And, um, but there was um, a moment after the discovery um, and before the teammates came and, and that um, of introspection, of, of being humble, of knowing um, who he was and what they, uh, what they, they stood for. And that was, um, it's always been a, a great moment and one that um, with respect to the families of Sandy Irvin also in the respect of the families of George Mallory. We uh, summited on the 17th of May, uh, Dave Hahn and I, um, in 1999, and had a go at the second step, but um, didn't get it completely free because the ladder was there. Um, to paraphrase Mallory, why did you step on the ladder? Well, because it was there. Um, and then came back in 2007, working with uh, Anthony Geffen and Altitude Productions, Atlantic Productions to do a, a biopic on the picture of jo on the story of George Mallory. And at that that second time, we had the permission to remove the ladder and um, have a go at it, uh, free climbing. And looking at the difficulty of the second step, and knowing that they were on the Northeast Ridge, um, Noel O'Dell had last seen them on the ridge um, somewhere between the first and second step. Um, 
and and then clouds enveloped the mountains and they were never seen from again. So that mystery within there. And it's not my place in life to be unequivocally, they didn't make it, it was impossible or anything like that. We do, we, we welcome mystery, we welcome the understanding of, of where it is. Um, and, but by the same measure to um, extend my own an individual's personal views that, oh, they could have made it without a doubt. And they were, they were coming back um, when they disappeared would be um, perhaps the way I see it is an overestimation of their abilities and that it was more um, that the equipment and the technique they had at the time, um, the climbing rope was um, a hemp sisal rope and it was there uh, much in the way that if you're riding on the tube and you have the hand strap and it keeps you from toppling over, it's, it's, it's an assist, but it's not in the same way that we use protection, we clip carabiners to the protection and then the rope goes through it and we have a safety system built into that. And those, um, that technique of climbing was only coming around in, in the 1930s um, in, in, in the subsequent expedition. So the, the rope was, um, was there to, to provide comfort people. And that was um, in that sense. But if they were to have summited, they would have had to down solo the second step, which um, is uh, to do that at, in, in the cold at dark um, would be, um, and climbing down without a rope is, is oftentimes um, more frightening than climbing up because you're your senses are right here. They're visual. You can like lock onto the rock, but when it's down by your feet, it's a little bit different. But um, yeah, I, with a tremendous amount of respect to the uh, Alpine Club um, for their support of those uh, pioneering expeditions. And that um, when June 8th, 1924, the centenary comes up in a couple of years now, three years, that, that we, um, we remember who they were um, and what they stood for and what their, what their goals were. And um, all of this is um, times have changed and we, we, um, we can see it through a revisionist lens and, 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 um, and a sale and, and the values of that. But, but that aside for what they, what they attempted to do at the time was, was remarkable. Well, thank you, Conrad. Uh, really, really interesting answer. Thank you. Um, Nigel, do you want to, to come in a, again with YouTube? Uh, uh, yeah, we have, we have two more. So this is from Stuart Smith. Um, quite a funny one. Who is, who is the better singer or whistler or joke teller? You or Leo Holding. And what's your favorite earworm to get you through an expedition? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, Leo's... Um, yeah, their um, English sense of humor is, is a bit more wry, and there's there's always a hint of sarcasm. So I'll give uh, Leo the better uh, being a better humorist on that one there. So um, and then uh, I guess the the music, the earworm, is a way of saying you get a song in your head, and hopefully it's not the song that is on the radio when you set your alarm. We do that off our mobile phones, and it. it it makes a ping instead of a, like it would turn on to the radio station and, you know, uh, heaven forbid it'd be Boney M or ABBA or something in your mind. But it's usually, um, there's some song that um, each expedition kind of brings it to. Um, so 2012, the expedition on Everest, it was a beast of burden by the Rolling Stones. So <laughs> that was kind of, um, resonant to it um there's uh because i think one time we had a moby song that was we were looping uh on and on um but um yeah it's it's amazing now that we you know with our handheld computers and the sound that we can bring stereos and things like that it's it's vastly different than say it was in the 80s when i started climbing and that it was now, if you're going to bring music, it was going to be this, you had to bring batteries and you had to bring the cassettes and it was like, there weren't external speakers. And, and so it became kind of a production and um, it, um, 
but yeah, music in the outdoors is good. Um, and there's uh, the, uh, I guess well, my last trip to Antarctica was on Vincent and um, we had a, uh, a, a, a Syrian DJ with like, like really chill music. That was kind of the, the song that we listened to then. But um, may our songs always continue to change. <laughs> Donald, I, I should say that I heard your Desert Island Discs and I, I thought you got excellent choice. <laughs> oh, I thank you. Yes. Uh, and and to, to uh, Kirsten, that was, um, yeah. And what I, I had no idea what Desert Island Discs was. You know, they contacted me and I'm like, so I was just kind of researching it and, and um, the choice of music there. And so, yeah, the, the question on that was, would this really be the only six songs or six artists that you would listen to if you were stuck on a desert? Or is it like your six songs that you're trying to tell a story with? Um, but um, Kristen was great. Our interview was um, being able to visit um, the BBC offices. Um, we get BBC news here in the United States. It's, um, it's a good, um, Getting news from multiple news sources is always good, and their um, the global perspective is always good. So, um, yeah, thanks. It was just kind of a, it was neat. I'm humbled to have been part of that. So, <laughs> it, I, I recommend everyone to, to listen. I, and your luxury item was a, was a a rope and a rack, which I thought was a good choice. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they had asked that for other people. Like, what do you? I mean, yeah, they're like. Well, yeah, I'm stuck on the island. There's got to be some cliff somewhere, right? And so we had a rope and a rack. Um, I, I always imagine them as like flat desert desert islands with palm trees and sand, but but you can live in hope. <laughs> I, I, yeah, the desert island would be um, Puerto Rico or in Thailand where there's limestone cliffs. <laughs> Rather than just some flat place with a coconut that washes ashore. So... But um, yeah, these wonderful escapisms that we have in our mind. And um, it's sort of like when you're on expedition, you're always like, oh, you get hungry. And then you start talking about food and your most favorite meals. And then it always comes around like, if I had like the personal wealth of say someone like Jeff Bezos, what would you do with that money? And it becomes these, these semantic exercises of like, you know, we're kind of projecting our own value set onto it, but it was um, always come back to those kind of conversations. <laughs> Brilliant. There's a question from um, T. Moore. Uh, often climbers will say there was a book or an article that really sparked their interest in climbing and the mountains at a young age. Uh, do you remember being inspired at all by a particular piece of writing yourself? Uh, the one seminal piece that really connected me with me was um, the West Ridge by Tom Hornbein. So 1963, I was one year old and Tom is still with us. Um, he and William Sold um, climbed the West Ridge and they, um, they uh, his book is wonderful. And it has, it, it's a mixture of quotes and, and the emotion of being on the, on the expedition, what it was like to lose Jake Breitenbach. And so, but as a, as a youngster, my dad had that book around the house and he had the poster on the wall and he was like, he was the same age. So he looked up to that maybe in a way that a parent now might have a picture of say a climber on, on the side of the, um, where they're at with it. But it was, um, yeah, that book was, um, and still to this day is, is a really key part. So the West Ridge by Tom Hornbein. And you read that when you were one, one years old. Yeah. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. At two, I was starting to climb out of the crib and at one, we know what's going on. You're just filling your diapers up. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and being there, no, but it probably wasn't until, um, oh, probably, oh, where I could read. And I mean, I, initially I'd look at the pictures, but it was this big thing. I mean, we had that poster, um, which was the cover of the book. And it was, my dad had it foam mounted and it was in, it was in the family room and that we had this like, wow, this is um, that was sort of, and when I got started climbing, Everest was still the bee's knees. It was like what you did. And I remember following 
the southwest face of Everest and being like, wow, Bonington organizing this trip and then Dougal Hassan and the late Doug Scott summiting and, and with Ankemba and, and just that that connection. And, 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 um, and then obviously now Everest is much different. Um, cutting edge climbing um, by and large doesn't take place on Everest. It's at the lower elevation peaks on more technical climbing. But um, back when I was starting out, you'd, you'd walk across the knee on the road on your knees to meet someone. And I remember um, coming to see a Doug Scott slideshow in, in Berkeley in, in, in the eighties. And it was like, wow, this is so cool. And, and he had his John Lennon specs and his long hair. <laughs> it was like, this is cool. This is, um, this is, this, uh, this, uh, this validates who I am. I have someone to look up to and a tremendous um, amount of respect for Doug Scott, his um, community action, Nepal work that he started with and um, his recent passing that, um, that we all have a moment of respect for what he was able to bring to the sport. Yes, he's, he's sorely missed, I must say. Um, uh, there's a message in from Ronnie Kenyon, the great Ronnie. He says, try Pabby for a desert island. And that's a, an island off the west coast of Scotland with fantastic climbing. So, so there's one for you. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, Michael, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, there's a, another question on, on YouTube here. Another one from Robin Romer, actually. Um, what kind of communication devices are a must on expeditions like this? Um, great question. So um, in this day and age, um, the um, probably the most connected one has is um, with a um, an inReach. So um, it's a small. I'm going to step aside for two seconds and I'm going to hold it up. I think we need to do a drum roll. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for your patience. And so this is like, I mean, this is, I'm not endorsing this or anything like that, but it does work out. And so we call it the flux capacitor. And then you connect that with your mobile phone and you can then text in 160 uh, word text. And so it, it Bluetooths to your cell phone and then you can then text in there. And so um, that is um, sort of global connection and, and the challenge we have now is how do we wield the tool but not be wielded by the tool? And that applies to social media, it applies to communication. So obviously um, with a satellite phone, you can just pick it up and you can, you're talking um, live. And it, um, we carry a satellite phone in case there is an emergency. But part of it is that um, when I started out, we when I went to, Kashmir for the first time in 1988, we went off the map and sent my mother a postcard, would, would get in there four months later. But then our deal was is that we would send a telex. And so they would, <laughs> I would send a telex from Delhi and my mother was always like, oh no, here comes the guy, the telex, because they would hand deliver them in the eighties and, and she would have to open it up. And it was always and I was like, if the telex man's driving up, it's a good sign. And if it's the sheriff and, 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 and they have a long drawn out face, then it's probably not good news. But um, yeah, finding that communication balance and not being over um, communicated. And it's, um, yeah, we're all in the middle of this um, great experiment with social media. It's only 12 years old now. And it, um, if you've watched the film Social Dilemma, you can understand um, the negative downside of, of, of what these, um, what's going on. And it, it, it's feeding on this positive feedback that then clicks into an algorithm and it, it's changing things. So there's, I'm very mindful of that. And I enjoy being without communication and being with my own thoughts. And um, it, um, you know, as a professional climber, it's not responsible to be leading an expedition to be completely off the map. And if something does happen, but having that communication equipment um, and being there to, um, to work out. And then um, I found that the uh, small little handheld radios, um, they're tiny, they're not much bigger than this, um, that when you're on a multi-pitch that 
your communication is better and and it doesn't get you hoarse. You're not like, I'm off the leg and rope is fixed or watch out for the edge or bring up an extra jacket that if you are doing that, that the communication that you have with your team works out pretty well. So great question. Thanks. Uh, one more, I think, Nigel, you said you have? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's one more. Um, did anything uh, bad happen on your expedition? Anything go to wrong? Queen Modland? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and Queen, no, nothing bad happened. Um, yeah, everything went according to plan and um, we had to, um, the, um, we had to go under the auspices of the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States because we are US citizens. And so even though we were in Norway and being our outfitter was, uh, was Russian, that we still had to, to go by the, the rules that they had set there. So there was a fair amount of, um, and kind of connected to that, there's a uh, great question here from Sebastian Wolfram about the, um, the, uh, the carbon footprint. So beginning in 2013, all uh, corporate travel for the brand that I work with um, is, is that's built into the price. And then beginning in 2017, all expeditions um, use, um, we, we then purchase carbon offset on that. So um, carbon offset is a, a voluntary tax that then goes into a way with that. And in the process of that, we developed a carbon calculator. And if you go to the Protect Our Winners webpage, you can um, look into it. So say if you're gonna drive from London up to the Lake District to go climbing and you had three people in your vehicle, what would that be? And so there's um, a way to do that. And um, until we have a global price on carbon, which is gonna be really difficult to get 170 nations to agree on it, um, that voluntary carbon tax in the form of carbon offset is, is what we need to do. And so um, I've been an advocate for that and all of our, um, but we haven't had an expedition in the, in the last year. So we'll, we'll come back around to it. I, I just put a link in. I, ho I hope it's the right one. <laughs> oh yeah. It'll link through there. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, good stuff. And on the, on the question of did anything bad happen? Um, I mean, I was aware, uh, that must have been the first trip you'd done after after you you suffered a heart attack. So did that must have raised the stakes quite a bit, and you must have felt a, a wee bit sort of, you know, on edge perhaps. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was more concern on someone else's end. So um, there's uh, um, the um, this is. This is, this is what rules my world, it's gravity. And so I have to, um, that's always um, <laughs> where, where at the end of the day that we're born and we struggle with gravity and the end of the, the gravity wins and that's it. But we really worship gravity as climbers. And so we really um, do that. And if gravity was in a, if it was my day, then that would be fine. But um, it's also, um, you know, a testament to the modern, medicine, being able to have a stent that was put in my arm, um, through my arm into my heart at a teaching hospital with a bunch of students and then um, uh, the medicine that I'm on with this. So there's some, um, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm public about it. And there's other people that have heart, um, things like that. And it was interesting because prior to this, I'd been part of a long-term study for being healthier than than, than my age and not that, I mean, in the United States, it's not a high bar to cross because a lot of people don't care about the health, but um, trying to, to understand that, what was it? And part of it was this feast and famine thing that you go through on expeditions where you run out of food and then you don't. But I think that my initial, the what brought that heart attack on in 2016 was climbing Everest in 2012 without supplemental oxygen. And during that expedition, we were monitoring our health and that was, um, the um there we were in there so oh yeah there's simon we met in kishwar in 88 so yeah and that was talking about the the the, the trip to uh to uh, uh jammu kashmir in 1988 so there's yeah th thank you simon <laughs> we'll have to come climbing together but yeah there's um yeah, there i try to be optimistic in life and it um and each day is your best day so live it to the fullest <laughs> 
Well, Comrade, un unless there are any more questions coming in, um, Nigel, I think that's a brilliant way to, to finish. There's um, one more. It might be a, a, a good way to finish as well. Uh, Conrad, uh, which of the great past climbers would you like to share a rope with? Great past climbers to share a rope with? On a desert island. <laughs> on a desert island. Um, oh, gosh. But if you're on a desert island, you really couldn't ice climb, That's right? not part of the question, really. I just added that. <laughs> no, you got a rap and a rope on your desert island, so you're fine. You just need yeah. a partner. Um, but yeah, the... the um, yeah, there's... There's so many wonderful climbers out there. Um, I've always been intrigued by Willow Weltzenbach, who did all these ice routes in the Alps and in in pre-war and, and what that was like. Um, but then also um, Native American climbers here in the United States. And um, they, I mean, they're climbing 5'8". Um, I'm not sure how that translates into uh, international grade, but 5'8 is, is consequence climbing. And they were climbing that grade years ago, centuries ago. And that um, what went through their um, sort of that connection to it. And again, comes back to the beauty of climbing is this really fundamental thing that is deep in our, our id of what we know how to do is to go up a mountain and to look over the other side. And because of that, religions around the world, all the, the great religions of the world and um, the, the way that people view mountains have always, there's always been a connection to mountains in, in people's uh, worldview. And so finding those, those prehistory climbers and, and being able to share with them. But again, this is a wonderful, these sort of questions, everyone's like, so what do you do in your tent when you're stuck for eight hours? <laughs> this is exactly what we do. It'd be like, well, if you could go climb with anyone at any time, or can you imagine what it would be like to, um, what were the Alps like in the mini ice age or all these, these, different, um, these different questions. And so that, um, that's these, these uh, mental gymnastics. That's what we do when we're stuck in a tent. <laughs> so, yeah. Brilliant. So nice. Any other questions out yeah. there? <laughs> Any other questions? I see Mick Fowler's just joined, so hi to Mick. Uh, hey, Mick, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Tom Moore just says, thank you for your reply. I've had Tom Hornbein's The West Ridge on my shelf for a while. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's good. That's inspiring. Yeah. Good. Oh, well, so. I think. Um, I think we'll leave it there, shall we, Conrad? Uh, I, I gather you're going out climbing later, so uh, um, we should uh, we should let you go. But um, I'll just uh, tell folks a, little, a wee bit about what happens next week, if I may. Um, so next week, Alpine Clubcast number 25, uh, we're heading to the wild west of Nepal, one of the least explored areas in the Himalaya with hosts of unclimbed mountains over 6,000 meters on the Tibetan frontier. We're going to trace the origins of the 1960s of the trekking boom in Nepal, which came full circle for Henry Edmondson when he returned after his early exploration to climb Dalagiri 7 in 2007. Then we head northwest with Becky Coles and Paul Ramsden. Both have achieved notable first ascents up there, and Paul's stunning line on Gavding with Mick Fowler was awarded a PLA door. So see you next week for that. Meanwhile, do have a look at the Alpine Club Library YouTube page, which you can subscribe to for updates. There you can watch, like, and share all the previous Alpine Clubcasts. So folks, if you could unmute yourselves now. Uh, thanks all for joining us. Uh, keep safe. Uh, and please put your hands together to applaud tonight's speaker, Conrad Anker. Good night from London. Thank you. Very much. Oh, interesting. Not going to leave that now. That's all right. Thank you, Conrad. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Where, where, where are you watching now? We have um, the. Um, the afternoon at four o'clock, the um, 
it's our last window of ice climbing. So we're going to, um, there's a high school group that I get out and mentor. So we, um, we, um, we get out there and we're going to go ice climbing and we start at four in the afternoon and we go until 